so so far we have talked about three ways of invoking apex one is through visual force classes visual force controllers where you connect your apex logic to a pitch okay and then uh, the apex logic gets executed when the page is loaded or the page is refreshed or you click on a button right that's one second is you can write an anonymous code block this is where you don't need to write save nothing you just have to write it and execute it so this is okay for one time execution of an apex code then third is apex trigger there's something which works with the dml operations before or after dml okay. now all these three ways of invoking apex are basically synchronous ways of apex invoking apex synchronous apex all these three are synchronous apex okay what is this synchronous apex synchronous apex means it is in complete sync with some other event right so the apex code execution is sync with some other event in case of a visual force controller what happens the apex code gets executed when you are loading a page or when you are clicking on the button right at that time the apex code gets executed so these two events are on yeah, are in sync correct in case of an anonymous code block when you are clicking on the execute button right at that moment the code gets executed so this is also synchronous apex trigger the code is getting ex executed exactly uh, before the record gets inserted or after the record gets inserted so this is also in sync Now, apart from these synchronous ways of uh, invoking apex we also have some asynchronous apex okay Now, what is asynchronous apex asynchronous apex is an apex code that gets executed asynchronously so it does not have to be in sync with some other event it can get executed asynchronously okay uh okay now you will feel that why do we need such an apex or why do we need such apex execution why should we have something which gets executed asynchronously the reason is pretty simple uh the synchronous apex the problem with synchronous apex is that if the synchronous apex does not find the resources available let's say there is an execution which has to happen and the resources are not available okay then that synchronous apex gets cancelled you initiated a synchronous apex it found that the resources are not available that synchronous apex will get cancelled okay asynchronous apex on the other hand does not get cancelled even if the resources are not available so even if there is a problem resource not available that method cannot be executed right now it will not get cancelled it will stay in the queue wait for the resources to become available got it so that's the advantage of asynchronous apex that it waits for the resources to become available and then it gets executed it might get delayed but it will not get cancelled at the same time synchronous apex is it will not get delayed it will execute synchronously with the other thing like if it has to execute before insert it will execute exactly before insert if the resources are not available it will throw error it will get cancelled it could not execute the trigger but it's not going to uh, you know it's not going to get delayed on the other hand asynchronous apex is something which might get delayed it will execute today after 2 hours after 4 hours tomorrow but it gets in the queue and it waits for the resources to become available Correct. So that is the advantage of asynchronous apex. Now, depending on our requirement, we choose whether we need a synchronous apex or asynchronous apex. Right. So there are several ways of uh, invoking asynchronous apex. 
Once we talk about that, you guys will have better idea about asynchronous effects. So there are different ways of uh, invoking asynchronous effects. One is called a future method. Okay, future method is like our normal method only, but it can be executed in future also. So the difference between the methods that you have been defining so far and a future method is, if you make a method as a future method. That method, if it cannot be executed right now, will get in the queue and wait for the resources to become available and then it will get executed. Your normal method, if it cannot be called right now, it will not be executed at all. All right. So that's a future method. So now we'll have to see, you know, what kind of requirement, uh, in which kind of requirement we need future method. Yeah, right. Now, the another thing is queueable effects. Queueable effects is also, you know, a type of epics code. You define it as a class. And here you have the option of straight away putting the code into the queue. If you're not even calling the code, you're just putting it in the queue. Whenever uh, the other methods which are in the queue, they get cleared, this queue will get executed this fx will get executed okay. so this is usually done for long running operations so in case you think that you have a long running operation uh, you are actually going to do some update in the database or something like that so instead of doing that right away you might just want to put that particular operation in the queue so that whenever the resources are available it gets executed okay so the good thing is that these asynchronous fx uh, they wait in the queue and they give priority to the synchronous FX because synchronous FX is considered to be your the high priority logics. When a user is loading the page, it's important for him to uh, for his FX code to execute first because there the user is waiting for the result or he's actually uh, waiting for the output on the page. Correct. So for that reason, this kind of long running operations and all these things can be put in the queue. So that when the resources are available, you know that, that many people are not using it, that time it can get executed. Schedulable effects. Schedulable effects is basically the apex code which can be scheduled. So instead of you calling the apex code or you executing manually, it will automatically execute on the defined schedule. So you've written an apex code and you have defined that okay, execute it every Friday at 7 p.m. So this code will automatically execute every Friday at 7 p.m. So no manual uh, you know, initiate thing with the code is not required. Batch FX. Batch FX is basically uh, performing a big task in small batches. So sometimes what happens is uh, you might be wanting to do a big operation using your FX code and uh, you know your sales force might not allow you to do that entire job in one transaction so in that case you might want to perform that in multiple transactions small small transactions right? so that's batch FX right okay so now let's have a look into these uh, asynchronous FX one by one Future method and all this. Okay, so the first thing is future method. What's a future method? A future method runs in the background asynchronously. Okay, 
So it's like a normal method, just that you define that method as a future method. Now, the moment you make a method as a future method, it will run in the background asynchronously. So whenever the you know <clears throat> end user calls this method, this method tries to execute. If it sees that the resources are not available, it will just wait in the queue for the resources to become available. So it runs in the background asynchronously. So if you have called the method now, if now the resources are not available, it will get executed after some time. But it will get executed. That's sure. Till the time it does not get executed, it's going to wait in the queue. So you can call a future method for executing long running operations. So this is also something which can be used for long running operations. Or any operation you would like to run in its own thread on its own time. So or any other operation that you would like to run on its own time. Each future method is queued and executes when system resources become available. So these future methods actually go and wait in the queue. In Salesforce, we will see that uh, we have an option of looking into the Apex job queue. So these feature methods and queueable Apex, they go and wait in the queue and wait for the resources to become available so that they can be executed. To define a future method, all that you have to do is you simply need to annotate it with the feature annotation. So if you want to make a future method as a future method, all that you have to do is the moment you are defining the method there, before the method, you just have to give this at future annotation. Only this keyword, if you use it, if you, you know, uh, start the method with this, the method becomes a future method. If you don't give this, then what will happen? The method is a synchronous effect. A synchronous, synchronous method. So synchronous method is either it will get executed if resources are not available, it gets cancelled. Okay. But if you uh, annotate the method with at future, then it becomes a future method. So if, if it cannot execute right now, it will go and wait in the queue. So that's the only thing that you have to do. Okay. And then you know just write whatever code you want to write in the method. Okay. Methods with the future annotation should be static methods and can only return a void type. Okay. So we have talked about void and non-void methods. Right? Void method is something which does not return anything. Non-void method is something which returns something, you know, which returns a value. So a future method should always be a void method which means it should not return anything, okay? You cannot define a non-void method as a future method. All right, can anyone tell me what is the logic? Why can't we define a non-void method as a future method? Anyone? Why can't we define a non-void method as a future method? What is the logic? return type and that return type executes instantly when you click the button or when you save the page. Uh, but this method doesn't have an instant return. Right. I mean, so the non-word method has a return type. So non-word means what? It's going to return some value. If it is going to return some value, some other action is pending on that return value. In case of a page reload. Your get method is a non-word method. It returns some value. Now that return value gets returned and that is when it's going to get displayed on the page. Right? So there you cannot have an asynchronous method. There you cannot say that, hey, uh, my method will execute whenever it wants because the end user is waiting for the page. Okay? Or some other method is waiting for to get a value from this so that that can be used there. So those non-word methods cannot be asynchronous. At all, you have to have an asynchronous method that has to be a void method where there is no return value, no one is waiting. It just has to execute something in the backend 
you can do it now or half an hour later or two hours later does not matter but for a return type method a method which has a return type where the end user or some other method is waiting for a value to return there it cannot say that oh i'm going to get executed after three hours there so that is the thing so if i you know if i ask you a question right now and i tell you that answer me now which means i'm expecting an answer from you that's going to be a synchronous thing so you have to answer it right now you cannot say that i'll answer whenever i want you just give and wait it i you know, just sit here and wait whenever i feel like i'll answer right but if i give you a project that okay do whenever you want and let me know that's kind of asynchronous so you can do it after two days and then inform it okay so that sort of thing so always a uh, future method has to be a void type okay and in case you want to specify a parameter that must be of the primitive data type or arrays of or list of primitive data type so in case you have to specify a parameter that also has to be a primitive data type or collections of primitive data types okay now what is this logic why it allows only primitive data types primitive data types as parameters means string integer boolean these things it cannot take s object as parameter in case you have to supply a parameter then it cannot take s object as a parameter also why methods with feature annotation cannot take s object or object as arguments or parameters what is the reason behind that so if you are trying to use a parameter for a feature method it cannot be s object what's the logic behind that the logic is very simple s object is what record s object is record data right now there is a possibility that when you call the method you know we understand that a future method can the you know there can be a delay in execution of the future method so you might call the future method today it might get executed tomorrow or if you might call it today and it might get executed after two hours so there is a time lag between the calling of the method and execution correct now what happens here if you are uh, defining an s object as a parameter then there is a possibility that the value of that s object or that particular record gets changed in the uh, between the time you called it and when you executed it actually got it so for that reason you cannot pass s object as a parameter okay so if you are passing s object as a parameter the value of that s object might change between the time you call it and then when it actually gets executed in that case what will happen it is going to override the old value in the database okay so method with feature annotation cannot take s object or objects as arguments the reason why s object can't be passed as argument to future method is the fact that s object might change between the time you call the method and the time it executes so it might change between the time you actually call the method and the time when you execute it in this case the future method will get the old s object values and might override them got it you have an s object here let's say let's go back this is what this is an s object right list of s object now i define a future method for this 
public Now here uh, you have defined parameter for this list of account ACGs. Okay. And you've written some code here. Code to update records. Let's say you just want to write some code to update these records. Fine. I've written some code here. So this code is going to execute on these records. That's what uh, you know it's supposed to do. Now the problem is that the values basically the values in this S object might get updated. So you if you call this method at 7 a.m. That's it. Call it at 7 a.m. Okay. And the method actually got executed at 10 a.m. There's a possibility that the values get updated by 10 a.m. Someone might change the data in that meantime, right? In that case, what will happen? The method still has the old value, 7 a.m. value. So after that, if it executes, it's going to execute it with the old values, the 7 a.m. value. And it's going to overwrite your 10 a.m. value. The user, whatever updates were done by users, they will be overwritten by this method. So that is going to actually make your database inconsistent. That is the reason why you cannot uh, use S object as a parameter for your future methods. All right. Now, if I cannot use S object as parameter, then what is the best way to deal with S objects in future methods? To work with S object that already exists in the database. Now, whenever we are talking about a method in Salesforce, whenever we are talking about a uh, program in Salesforce, we are actually going to do it for records only, right? Now I just said that, no, we cannot do it for records. Then it actually does not make that much of sense, right? If we are not able to handle records, because why would I actually want to do it with uh, primitives? What exactly are we going to do with primitives? Most of the time, these methods are going to be defined for updating records or, you know, performing some action on the records. So what is the best way of dealing with it? There it is. To work with S objects that already exist in the database, pass the S object ID, okay? Instead of passing S object, pass the ID of the records. And use the ID to perform a query of the most up-to-date records. Got it? Now, ID is a primitive data type. If you guys remember, we saw that there is a data type called ID. ID is a primitive data type. So you can pass the ID of the records as a primitive data type and then you can call it at the time of execution. You can query the data at the time of execution. Okay, so before that, before I get into uh, the ID Vala concept, are we clear here? Did we understand why we, are, we have a problem here? Do we have any questions here? Do we understand what, what is going to be the problem if I uh, put S object as a parameter here? Okay, so we are good on this. Now, one thing which we have to understand, even if the records get updated, now the problem that we are talking about is that if the method gets called at 7 a.m., the uh, method is going to take the values at 7 a.m., and actually when it executes at 10 a.m. or whatever time, in that meanwhile, the records may change. The values in the records may change. Correct? Now, there is one field which will not change between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. and whatever time. What is that field which is never going to change for that record? What is that field? ID. ID, ID is going to be unique and it's going to be static throughout. So no matter the record gets executed today, tomorrow. So instead of doing this query here, 
we just have to understand a small logic here. And this might be a little important from your interview perspective. Uh, yeah, sometimes they might be, you know, put you this kind of question, how are you actually going to deal with a future method uh, to process some records? So instead of doing the query here, see now here what we have done, we have queried, we have an S object, we have used this object as a parameter. Okay. Instead of that, what you are going to do is, uh, okay. define a list of ID, call it record IDs. Okay, so in this you can have all the record IDs of the records which you want to process. Okay, and go to public sorry. and then define this method same method but here instead of passing the s object you just pass the So instead of passing the S object, you just pass the record IDs. This is primitive data type. ID is primitive, it's not S object. Okay. Now all that you have to do is you just have to do the query inside it. List of account. So now what you have done, you have defined IDs as the parameter. So when you call the method at 7 a.m., let's say you know the IDs from 0 to 100 are called. When it is getting executed at 10 a.m., ID 0 to 100 is going to be 0 to 100. No one is actually going to update the IDs. You cannot even update the IDs. So ID is going to be same, right? Now, when the method actually gets called, at that time, it will pick the IDs and it will do the query at the time of execution. So now the S object values are coming at the time of execution. So what is happening? You are working on the most up-to-date uh, values. Got it? Earlier, what was happening? The values in the S object were coming at 7 a.m. and the actual code was getting executed at 10 a.m. Now what is happening? Only IDs are being taken at 7 a.m. Okay, and the actual code can be executed at 10 a.m. or whenever it has to execute because IDs are going to be static, they are going to be fixed. So that's the thing. That's how you can actually deal with records. Now this future method is kind of a little out, uh, not, not that uh, useful nowadays because of all these complexities. Only reason that you need to understand future method well uh, at this point of time is uh, because Sometimes in your interviews, you will have these concept related questions. But now we have a better way of doing the same thing uh, through QML events. Okay. Uh, because future method was actually not allowing us uh, that ease of use. That's the reason why Salesforce has come up with a new thing called QML events. The second thing that we were looking at. Uh, future method. So future method is a little. Um, older version of doing things. Now we have a newer way of doing it. Okay. <clears throat> so next we will talk about QML effects and we will see how the problems or the challenges, though we have a solution to the challenge here also, but that is also a slightly uh, not that much uh, you know, convincing solution. So we are going to see how QML effects can help us, uh, you know, do things better in a better way. All right. Coming to QML. Yeah. 
Anyone has a question here in the future method thing? Yeah. Uh, hmm. So uh, I understand why the method is uh, void, but why the method is static here? Yeah. Tell me. Sorry. I understand why the method is void, but hmm. why it is static? Yeah, it has to be a static method also because again it is getting executed, you know, to, uh, um, so you, you just have to understand that when it is getting called and when it is getting executed again, there can be a lag. So it has to be a static method. So you cannot actually have, you know, too many uh, variables, uh, you know, uh, being passed which are not uh, static. So for that reason, again, this has to be a static method always. Any method that you are, you know, calling like this. Uh, are have to be static methods. Okay, any methods which are part of a class and you know uh, being called into that, they might not be static methods. But this kind of a method always has to be static and future methods especially, because you know this is kind of being called as a standalone uh, standalone method. Correct. So whatever variables it has to take, it will take at once and you know it will go ahead and wait in the queue as an individual method. So again that makes it compulsory for you to have it as a static method. Uh, hello, Jeet. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one question. Mm -hmm. How we can uh, call this future method after particular sometime? Let's uh, see uh, if I call it on 7 a.m. and after it executed on 10 a.m. You don't have to call it. How this is this possible? Is, no, you don't have to call it. That is the beauty of future method. It's very obedient. So once you call it, if it does not find resources available, it's going to wait. And whenever the resources become available, it will automatically execute. So we don't have to do anything here. Not just for future method, for all asynchronous. For all four types of asynchronous effects that you have seen, they are going to go in the queue, wait in the queue, the resources become available, they will get executed. Okay, okay. Fine. So you don't have to call it again and again. It is automatically going to do that. So you can call this method from anywhere. You can call it from a button. You can call it from uh, anywhere. You can call it from an anonymous code block. So, but the point is that once you've called it, it, um, it will go and wait in the queue. If it does not find the resources instantly. It's going to wait in the queue. When the resources become available, it will get executed. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. The parameter you told about uh, S object. Mm -hmm. What about uh, custom object we can use? S object, custom object is also S object, right? Okay. S object is what? What does S object stand for? It's not a standard object. No, it's uh, Salesforce object. Go it's Salesforce of so it stands for standard as well as custom. Okay. Now let's look into the queuable effects. Concept is exactly same. Long running operation. You don't want that long running operation to uh, you know hamper the other uh, what do you say the important uh, the high priority operations like triggers. Trigger is high priority for you because that needs to get executed at that point of time. If it does not get executed at that point of time, it will get cancelled. Right? A visual force controller method is a high priority because the end user is actually trying to look into a certain uh, page. Okay? So if that method cannot be executed, it will not see the results on the page. Correct? So those are the synchronous FX is high priority. Now, if you just have a long running operation, let's say you're, you want to perform a database update, you want to do database cleansing. Okay. Now, you know that this operation is going to take long time and you don't want to hamper your uh, the important logics and at the same time, you don't want this whole operation also to get cancelled. You know that this is not that high priority, but this is important. Even if, if it gets done tonight, that's absolutely fine. In that case, you use this uh, feature or queue. So Cable Apex actually gives you a better way of defining your uh, asynchronous effects. Okay. 
pretty similar to future method concepts are same just the way of defining it is a little different so you can take control of your asynchronous apex process by using the queuable interface okay so there's this queuable interface which you can implement on your class future method was a method queuable apex is going to be the class so you define the entire class class as queuable So what will this queuable interface do? This queuable interface enables you to add jobs to the queue and monitor them, which is an enhanced way of running your asynchronous FX code compared to the using future methods. So queuable FX is an enhanced way of running your FX code as compared to future method because future method had a few of challenges. Okay. So we saw one or two challenges with feature method. We are going to see more of them right now. For Apex processes that run for a long time, such as extensive database operations, you can run them asynchronously by implementing the queuable interface and adding a job to the Apex job queue. So basically, what happens uh, with the queuable Apex is <coughs> feature method is. It was the concept of just making a method as feature method. But in Cubel Apex, what you do is in Cubel Apex, all that we do is the moment you're defining the class, at that time only you implement the Cubel interface. Okay. Public class, whatever name of the class, and you write implements. Okay, so so far you have been writing classes like this. If you have to implement an interface, this is how you implement. Okay, what is an interface? Interface is more like uh, okay. uh, think of it, you know, as a library kind of thing, or you know, a, an additional class where some more programming is written, which it can refer to. So this queuable interface is also some additional program written somewhere else, which you are actually referring to in this class, which can be combined with what you are writing. Correct. So that's the thing. So what does this queuable interface allow you to do? This allows you to put this class in the queue and monitor this class. Okay. So this queuable interface will allow you to put this class in the job queue, Apex job queue, and you can monitor the class. So what is the status and all? Okay. See, you can run the code asynchronously by implementing the queuable interface and adding a job to the Apex job queue. Your asynchronous job runs in the background in its own thread and doesn't delay the execution of your main Apex logic. Okay. So why are we putting in the job queue? Because I want to make sure that I am not uh, <clears throat> trying to execute it right now. I just put it in the job queue and whenever the resources become available, it will get executed. Each queue job runs when system resources become available. Correct. Okay. Now this queuable apex one big difference between the cubal and future method is that that was a method this is a class we have converted the entire class as cubal class and then now you can actually put this class into the job queue correct now cubal jobs are similar to future methods as we can see the purpose is same but they are both queued for execution, but there's a small difference. Okay. They provide you with the queuable apex actually gives you some additional benefits. So the purpose is same. The way they execute is also pretty much same, but there is a little difference. And in fact, queuable apex has a few advantages on future method over future method. It has a few advantages over future method. What are those advantages? Advantage number one is whenever, okay, before this, uh, you know, before I get into the advantage part, think about one thing. 
in future method we talked about that you we can actually you know call the future method and the moment you call the future method it will get into the job queue if it cannot be executed it gets in the queue and it waits for uh, you know the resources to become available right so when there is a method like that if you have uh, you know uh, tried executing a method like that an asynchronous method would you not also want to check at times that uh, whether it got executed or not. Let's say you called something at 7 a.m. Now at 8 a.m. you might want to you know check whether it has got executed or not. What is the current status? Very obvious, right? For any asynchronous, we might want to do that. Future method does not allow you to do that. So you don't have a way to go and check that what is the status of the future method. That's a big problem with the future method. You call it and it will get executed, but there is no you know, a place where you can actually go and track what is the current status. Okay, so that's a challenge. Now that challenge is not there in Cable Apex. So Cable Apex does what? It gives you an ID. So you get an ID for your job. So every time you put a Cable Apex in the queue, job queue, you will get an ID for the job. When you submit your job by invoking the system dot job, so just don't look into the system dot We'll look into this later. So when you submit your job in the queue, that's what we're saying. Uh, that's what we're talking, right? That we can put the Apex code in the job queue. So when you put the job in the job queue, it returns an ID of the job. You can use that ID to track what is the status of that job. Okay. You can use this ID to identify your job and monitor its progress. So you have the option of monitoring the progress, which is a very big advantage as compared to future method, because in future method, we did not have any way of monitoring the progress, which was a bit of challenge. Okay. Second is you can use non-primitive data types also. Okay. In a queuable apex, you have the option of using non-primitive data type. So you are not restricted to primitives only. Okay. Your queuable class can contain member variables of non-primitive data types, such as as object or custom apex types, everything. So that problem is also not there, that we always have to work with primitives. Third advantage that a queuable apex has is chaining of jobs. What is chaining of jobs? Chaining of jobs means uh, Connecting one job with the other job. Right? So if you have one job and after that one job gets executed, you want to call the second job. That can be done in Cubable Apex. Okay. So you can change one job to another job by starting a second job from a running job. So basically what happens is because it's a class you can write some code here and before you know coming out of this class you can call another queuable apex so the code for this class can get executed and post that you can you know, before uh, terminating that code or before terminating, you just uh, call another cable class. So in this way, what are you doing? You are actually doing, making a chain of jobs. So once this first queue class gets executed, you call the second one. Got it? So that's how your cable apex is better than future method. This option was not there with our future methods. Okay. Now, how do you define a future uh, cable apex? It's pretty simple. So defining a future apex, uh, sorry, cable apex is very simple. First thing, there are two things which you have to keep in mind. One. It needs to implement, it should implement queuable interface okay. 
this is must second it should have a method called execute name of the method should be execute should have a void method called execute it has to have a void method called execute third is it uh, okay. use system dot in q job to put the class in the q okay so the third thing that you need to keep in mind is that you can use the system dot in q job to put the class in the q okay so that's how these three, three things we have to keep in mind so first of all when you are writing this public class name of the class implements so this is a must implements queuable so you have to do now it has to have a method called execute void method called execute right so public void execute right now whatever code you want to execute here that's completely up to you okay so this is the structure you always have to keep this structure in mind that this is how it should be written name of the method has to be execute why why is it so important to just keep it execute because it this code is working with your queuable interface so there are certain things which are defined there and we have to follow that so it has to be a void method and it has to, to be named execute inside the uh, method you can write whatever you want right and how do you uh, execute this how do you put it in the job queue to put it in the job queue you have to use the system dot system dot in queue job no class this is the method that you have to call to put this class in the job queue fine so this is what we have to do in order to put this in the job queue the rest everything is what you know the way you define anything else any other apex code just these three things we have to keep in mind that it should always implement the queuable interface uh, the name of the method has to be execute should be a void method and it needs to be uh, put in the queue so once i've written the class now how are I, how am i supposed to put it in the queue so to put it in the queue this is the method which we have to fine so we are going to do it and uh, we will uh, execute this uh, queuable class and we will also talk about the schedule level and batch apex in tomorrow session okay in now let me know if anyone has any difficulty understanding this